when I was filming a lot, I would by design go to wherever people weren't. Yeah. And I'd wait for essentially bad wind, you know, like, like, so it'd be air wind and I'd be tucked in a little cove. And I was savvy to the idea that like, Hey, I can't do the world's best air, but if I can do a good air with a cool backdrop, Mm -hmm. then it makes it a lot further than a cool air without a backdrop. If that makes sense. Nate Tyler. I'm Jamie Brissick. This is Soundings, brought to you by The Surface Journal. The Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, The Journal delivers 136 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. If you want to learn more, if you'd like to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Nate Tyler is a free surfer from California's Central Coast, known for his big airs, often with rugged, lonely backdrops. You might know him from the surf films Creepy Fingers, BS, Year Zero, Strange Rumblings in Shangri-La, and Psychic Migrations. He did his own profile film, titled Mute. I first encountered Nate in the surf near his home. I was watching from the car because of the cold and cruel wind. He was out all alone in victory at sea conditions. The wave was a crossed-up bouncing affair, and Nate was boosting the sort of airs you typically see in balmy, palm-tree-laden locales, which is to say he's loose and springy in a way that seems almost incongruent with his surroundings. Nate is 40, a husband, a father of three. He lives off-grid in a house that his parents built and where he was born. He's a maker of kinetic sculpture, i.e. sculpture that moves, all of which we get into in the podcast. Nate and I spoke at the Cruise Control Cambria, a gallery in Cambria, California. Welcome to the show, Nate. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so let's get into the idea of being in the water and having like a wave that's maybe not a desirable wave for most people, but seeing seeing these ramps, seeing these sort of corners to like launch off of. Mm-hmm. Because the first time I saw you surf, you were doing that. And what I connected with was partly like the big, huge boosting airs that you were doing, but most of all, just the mindset of sort of seeing something where like it was a blown out crappy day that most people would not have surfed. Mm-hmm. And you saw like places to do big airs. Yeah. I, I think it's just... That's just who I've always been and what I've always not by design, like done something different, but I think it's just like who I became and who I wanted to be when I was younger. I I just remember all I wanted to do when I was a kid was like pump down the line and do either a floater or try an air. Like I didn't, I don't even think I did a cutback or try to turn for so long. (laughs) Who were you looking up to at this time? During, I mean, I still, of course, look up to them, but, um, like Rob Machado was always my number one. Like I would watch his videos. Like I made a, a good friend of mine had this like impressive collection of old VHS tapes with all the old Taylor steel parts. And so I, I made a, my own video of all of Machado's sections and I would watch that religiously. Wow. And, um, so it was Rob Machado and Tim Kern and Kalani Rob. Those three goofy foots were just like, well, was such my idols. I, it's hard to explain. Like I've studied everything they did. It's so interesting the way if you're a goofy, you might be drawn to goofies. If you're a regular, you might be drawn to regulars. Did you ever do the classic uh, watching them in the mirror so you could turn Kelly Slater into goofy foot, let's say? No, it's weird. I never did that. Huh. It's funny. I, I hear about that. Um, but no, I, I never, there's something strange about that still to me. Yeah. It's like, their motions, their mannerisms, everything still looks off to me. No, so it's, it's it's so weird. Yeah, like, it doesn't. It still doesn't register as like as um, important and like how much you could learn from it. For sure. It just I can't. There's like a mental block I have where I'm like, Tom Curran can't be a goofy foot. Like it doesn't look right. Like yeah. <laughs> it's the oddest thing, and it's it's almost like 
there's it's I, and I haven't read anything about it. I haven't heard it talked about it, so it's fun to talk about. But there's almost this weird divide of unless, of course, you're a switch stancer, which some people yeah. are, but that's a very tiny majority mm-hmm. or minority. But myself as a regular foot, I came up in the era of Tom Curran, Mark Acalupo, and I'm a Curran guy, and mm-hmm. I love Aki, and I love everything he represents, and I love his surfing. But it is like I can't quite make the leap because. What he was doing backhand at Jeffrey's Bay was a different language to the one that I spoke, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, so, okay, so those guys, I know those those surfers personally, and I know they're they're surfing really well. And um, so you'd studied the videos and then- Yeah, so I, I was just going to say like, it is weird with, say like Rob, he, I would study him for his style and- I didn't understand this till way later in life, but I, I, like I said, I, I just really cared about style and like his fundamentals and where he put his hands and his first pump, where his feet were. Like I was always studying that. But then if you watched me surf, I of course wasn't surfing anywhere near that. And all I would try was errors, Mm -hmm. but there was something about his fundamentals that I was always drawn to, but I was also relatively a landlocked kid i lived especially during that time i lived like 20 miles from the beach but it was a windy road so i was like 35 minutes away from the ocean and i all i had was my i built like a little quarter pipe so i had my skateboard a quarter pipe and a patch of grass and i would just launch off the side of the quarter pipe trying different variations of airs and just land on the grass i do that one million times a day wow that's so cool yeah i looked like either a really dedicated kid or a really weird kid because i'd just be it wasn't even it you know i was skating to surf Mm -hmm. it's not like i was skating to skate yeah so i was never like a good skateboarder i just i was like just launching off the side of a quarter pipe right that's (laughs) so interesting um i i lived inland as well and there was the canyon road to get to the the surf Mm -hmm. and at the time it was like this unfortunate ob- obstacle that I had to deal with every day to get to the water because I wanted to live closer to it. Yeah. But my family couldn't afford to. Um, looking back, I'm actually glad because those drives, and as soon as I got my driver's license, a lot of the time it was by myself. It allowed this like, uh, what's visualizing kind of what we now might call um, uh manifesting Mm -hmm. it was this meditation basically of of like what i want to do in the water while i'm there and then on the way back i would kind of replay all my rides did you have something like this yeah i super similar in the sense like i look back on that you know i always thought it was a little bit of a bummer because i started surfing really late and then um we can kind of get into it if you want but like say my parents they had divorced so and my dad was the only one that was surfing with me so he would take me i got to visit him on friday nights so he'd pick me up friday after school we'd surf and then we'd surf saturday morning and then that was my week of surfing so i was just like you know it was it was really landlocked Uh uh-huh but to get back to what you were saying when i was i really enjoy those drives like they were so important for for me because it was like this point in time where i say when i got my license and i would listen to music I would essentially like suit up at my house Mm -hmm. a half hour away Mm -hmm. and just Mm -hmm. roast in my suit. And it was just amazing because it was like I was surfing no matter what. Now, older and spoiled, it's like I'll walk away on days and where I'm like, who the hell are you? Like as a kid, you would have been out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it is it is different. Yeah, interesting. Um, almost as important as the videos you watch and those surfers that you had in your head to inspire you, what were you listening to music wise? Um Gosh, a lot of like Taylor Steele soundtracks, so uh-huh. like Offspring. Um, yeah. I loved Danzig back then, which is kind of Oh, funny. yeah. I would always listen to too. Danzig. Um, I don't know, just a lot, probably a lot of Pennywise. But music to fire you up. Oh, yeah. You and I just did a little like surf check up and down. And, and looking at the place, it seems like um, A, that music, and B, knowing you're surfing, it's almost um, incongruous with the kind of like beautiful pastoral lands mm. and the kind of calming effect that this area has on you. And then you're surfing in this like super high, highly charged manner, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I was, I was, I don't, I feel like just back then though, that was, that was kind of the, everybody's drive, you know, was mm-hmm. those Pennywise days, like all that. And yeah, I mean, it, it does, I guess it does look a little bit weird 
for that up here. But growing up here, I never saw it as, you know, I, I don't drive around and go like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Every, you know, especially when I was 16. Sure, But sure. yeah, now I do. I'm like, Gosh. yeah. Were there other surfers up here on the Central Coast that were surfing in that style or were people surfing in a more laid back manner? Um, no, there definitely was. There was a crew. They, they were like a little bit of an older generation than me that were sort of, I don't know, what, what's the saying? Like my mentors or they took me under their wing. The guys I looked up to, there was like, they, and they all rode for Volcom. And so they kind of got me in on that scene and i was really looking up to them mm -hmm. so they helped shape that there's like troy powell and carl holm there was there was just a small group of guys that were pretty influential and mm -hmm. but yeah I, I still think i was kind of just doing my own thing i i never felt like a well-rounded surfer that's for sure <laughs> right getting good as a surfer it really is this it's very in, internal it's very mm -hmm. much like a thing that lives in your head and you see this thing that you can do and kind of keep working at it yeah when you think about your surfing life what are you what stands out what are you most proud of what are you hmm i don't know i you know i started i of course started like the the traditional like nssa and got into contest and I learned pretty quick that I was not great at contests. I just didn't, I don't know. I just didn't want to be there like fighting with friends for waves. And I'm like a really competitive person, but not in a surf contest way, if that makes any sense. Like, yeah. so, you know, I went through that whole era of my life and really was never that outstanding by any means on any level or any scale, you know? So, I, um, but I really enjoyed surfing and I loved the idea of getting to travel to mm -hmm. surf. And I kind of thought back then that that was the path you'd, you have to win contests and you get the sponsor and then you travel and to contests. And, um, so I was kind of at a crossroads when I graduated high school, because again, I wasn't doing anything too substantial in surfing. I wasn't, nobody was like checking in on me to, you know, like I, I wasn't like sought after or anything. So I like actually just went to a couple of days at the community college, like started to go down that path. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from, um, Greg Browning, who was, he was like working. He obviously was an incredible surfer, but I think he was at that stage, he was kind of like helping body glove out as team manager or coordinating some travel or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he called me, he's like, Hey, do you want to go on this, um, this body glove trip to Mexico. And I, and it was like, I was on the second day of community college and I just, it was so wild because I told, I told my mom, I'm like, I, I think this is a cool opportunity. Like it's be silly not to try it. She's like, okay, go for it. And so I essentially ended up dropping out of community college and went on that trip. And, um, I don't know, he just, that part introduced me to like the free surfing world that I didn't really I hadn't sought out because mm -hmm. I just didn't really know that it existed in the sense that it was like a structured thing. And he kind of taught me like the structure of it, like photos and whatnot. And so that was like a whole stage also that evolved into like, then it was like that, that weird timeline of where people were doing tow outs, like jet skis and you mm -hmm. tow out a wave and do like a giant fake air for the yep. camera or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I hit that pretty hard. And then, Let's see, after that, it, I kind of got like some opportunities with, with filming. That was kind of an era when you could film and be shooting photos at the same time. And I got some great opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And then like a film part came out and it just made me like, for some reason, that was just like the ultimate to me. Mm -hmm. And that, that was where I really fell, fell in love with like just the idea of I don't know. I, I just was the most proud of any film I was ever in. What's interesting to me is that you were maybe going down the path of like, I'm going to go to junior college and I'm going to get an education and do this. And then mm -hmm. suddenly it, it came and there was an opportunity and you seized it. Yeah. And, um, which so, is so strange because like, I feel like it's just that time in your life where you can be really flighty and just kind of just see what happens for where sure. like I'm, so the opposite of that now you yeah. know like yeah. everything has to be laid out in front and yeah so it's just i don't know i really appreciate 
that time and those weird paths that I took because they really molded me into like who I became. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just like so grateful for all those opportunities that came by those couple of silly decisions way back then, you know? Yeah. No, it's incredible that the thing that happens when you, the kind of arc, whether, and you were a free surfer, but for competitive surfers, it happens maybe in a little bit more of a competitively focused way. Mm -hmm. I think the cool thing about free surfing is it allows you to explore a little bit more and you don't yeah. need to like put the blinders on and just focus on your heat tomorrow morning. Totally. So you can hang out with the people more. You can uh, sort of engage in the cultures that you travel to. Mm -hmm. um, but. Sorry, I could elaborate on that a little bit. Please. Go, okay. Go, go. Um, I was just going to say like that, there was a a really pivotal point was um so i'd done all the the photo stuff and gotten a ton of really cool opportunities with that and i was riding for volcom and i thought it I, it felt like everything was going really really well and i with volcom i kind of like was a at a weird age where there was a generation before me and then there was a generation below me mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. and we're only talking like five year difference or yeah not even five years the guys below me but or younger than me um but so there was like films that were coming out on the older generation obviously and i was kind of up and comer and then got pretty established but then it was like the kind of like alex gray's mitch colburn and dusty Payne, and so they're all a couple years younger than me so i didn't really like like have exact fit there mm -hmm. and um i remember i'd done all the photo stuff and and i was just i think the first volcom film had come out it was creepy fingers that i was a part of and i got really lucky like i gave i went on a couple trips that ended up being like the good trips mm -hmm. and so i i got some playtime in that and i just remember that being like so incredible because volcom they did it in the coolest fashion like they didn't they invited me down to go to the film premiere, but they never even told me I had a wave in it. No kidding. Yeah. And so like the first time I got to see it was like on the big screen and it was wow. just, that was like, that was like the bug that bit me. So to say, like I was so all in on films after that. Yeah. And, um, what a great title, by the way, creepy fingers. is so, <laughs> it's so good. So, so good. Vulcan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was like a huge point for me where it's just, I don't know. I just felt, so proud after that like I, it's almost an unexplainable feeling like i it, it was a feeling like i hadn't really had that surfing hadn't given me you know yeah because it was i don't know i used to just always watch footage of myself and i really didn't like the way i surfed and mm -hmm. so to like see it on the big screen for the first time and like be really proud of waves i was just was really floored that that happened and so fast forward a little bit um there was this time it was like right around 2009 and um i had just gotten married and my wife and i like really wanted to save some money so we we went onto my dad's property and built this little it's, it was a yurt that we constructed but it was like totally off grid like did our solar setup our you know like we had our batteries as our as our power backup the solar panels the we had to Built, like we dug a spring, put our water tanks in, the solar pump, propane tank, like the whole thing. It was such a fun experience. And that really, my attention all went to that for a long time while we were building that. And um, during that time, I didn't know, but Volcom, they were starting a new film. And the film was going to be on Alex, Mitch, and Dusty. And, um, and it was like a real, like a big feature film. And so it was like my team manager had called and he was like, Hey, it looks like, it looks like we're going to be making a new film. And I was super excited because I had just, because after creepy fingers, I was all in and I bought a new camera and you know, it, it was like a really nice, it was like $4,500, which was essentially all the money I had back then. And mm -hmm. it was, and I just like invested heavily in filming and my wife, she was filming me all oh, around wow. here which was pretty incredible what a cool arrangement yeah it was the most fun era when we look back on it just because we were so free and 
So you're building the, you're, you're living off grid, you're doing all that together as a team. And then you're also like, exactly. I'm a great, I'm a great surfer and there's potential here. Shoot, shoot me while I surf and we'll put this together and we'll make this work for us. Exactly. Yeah. That's it great. was, it was such a fun time and she would travel with me. And when we were home, we'd just go try and film every day. And she was the perfect person to film around here because it's, you know, it's pretty frowned upon and she was just the sweet girl sitting on the beach filming nobody could ever really get mad at her right right <laughs> so um but yeah during that so we had been filming and we had invested pretty heavily like money into the camera and whatnot and then we got the word that the film the new film that was coming out was going to be alex mitch and dusty and i wasn't a part of it mm. and i understood it those guys were a lot better than me and they were you know they were doing big things where i was kind of at a stagnant point then but I was devastated just in the sense like, oh my God, why did I buy this camera? What am I doing? Like it just kind of really spun me out on like my career because I'm like, well, wait, I, and that was kind of what I meant by like the, the gap in age. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, where do I fit in? Because now I'm like out and those guys are younger. And yeah. so, but my team manager could, he could tell that I was just devastated and he was super cool. He was like, Hey, I have to tell you that it's those guys. He's like, but also I, since you're doing it, I would put my head, if I were you, I'd put my head down. I'd film all you can and just hand us all the footage. I right. When we this. go to the edit, edit bay. And I'm like, shit. Okay. That's a good, like good motivator. Cause I, like I said, I was pretty much just like, well, I just wasted all that. So I took the next eight months and we just filmed like I was part of the film mm -hmm. and we had, my wife and I traveled to Scotland, New Zealand, pretty much places that would look like here because it was a kind of a California based movie. And, um, and so just at the end, I handed them all the footage and again, they kind of got me. They're like, Oh yeah, it looks good. That's cool. Hopefully we can get a couple waves in there. But like the, the real like crescendo of all of it was, I like wedged my way into that film mm -hmm. and that was, it, again, it was like a thing where I just showed up and I was a major player in the film and like one of the starring roles. And so I just like fought my way in there, which yeah. is, I don't know that I'm really proud of that one because I essentially wasn't a part of it. And I like challenged myself and proved that I could be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still look back and I'm not nearly as well-rounded as those guys, but just to be a part of that film with those guys was so huge for me like I, so proud of that one i love this story so much uh what was the name of that film that was bs okay um you know it's interesting because i think you could arguably like every every great surfer male or female there's likely a partner well maybe not necessarily but the good proportion good portion have there's a partner and they're collaborative in it all mm -hmm. but i haven't heard of it so tangibly as my wife was filming me while I was surfing. Like I haven't yeah. seen a husband and wife team work in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and to have all those experiences of traveling to all those places. And the thing that we don't necessarily know at the time, because you was pro there was probably a little anxiety of like, did we waste the money on the $4,500 camera? Yeah. But in fact, it all paid off. And now your wife, you and your wife can look back and go, that all worked out. And oh, what no. a cool thing to experience together. Yeah, no, it was, that was like, that was such a fun stage because we were, we were so free and she was like so supportive and she was really good at filming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like she was incredible mm -hmm. at filming. And, and, you know, I, I was around incredible professional photographers and videographers on for so many years leading up to it that I felt like I had the eye for the angles and then like was working collaborative collaboratively with her on it. And it was like between the two of us, it, we were like, coming up with like real stuff that was getting used, you know what I mean? Which was pretty cool feeling. Cause it so wasn't just great. like, I don't know, like her, she like really had a, a solid little film career of doing that, you know, like wow. she made a little bit of money. Her name was always in the films. Like it was, I don't know. It was just such a fun, fun time to look back on. So cool. Um, I, I'm, I want to get into family, but before we do, you said one thing that, that I, I'm thinking about it being frowned upon to film around here. Mm -hmm. So we're on the central coast. Why is it that, is it because the, the spots are, people want to keep the spot secret basically? Well, I mean, I would imagine it's that. And, you know, I've, I've really always struggled with it. You know, there was the, the time when say I was like 
16 and cruising around with buddies in bright wetsuits and i was a little shit like i like at that era i didn't get it you know yeah because i was just like why is everybody so mean <laughs> you know yeah, like, sure <laughs> like i just want to shoot photos yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah i mean the central coast and north of here and i mean everywhere has their their spots that they don't like it being filmed and i i totally get it i totally respect it and i i feel like i tried to do it in a tasteful way mm -hmm. like i never really ex I, i'm sure people will say differently and I struggle with this to this day because it just like everywhere it's so crowded now. And I'm yeah. like, gosh, was that because of me? Yeah, like, sure. or did I hurt? I, you know, it's this weird thing where you're like, like, like you can't think like you're that cool that you brought all these people by doing this, but mm -hmm. you're also like, well, did I play a hand in it? Sure, you know? And, sure. and I, I've always struggled with that, but yeah, I think just traditionally, this place is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It has its days. I would like to say it has less days than people think because mm -hmm. we're so exposed to the elements. Yeah. Like this place is rough. It's, yeah. It was hard being a kid growing up surfing here. I see it with my kids. They're like, I don't want to go in the ocean. Yeah. Like, and I yeah. remember being like that. So I think traditionally this place is just rough and, but it has its days. And I think rightfully people wanted to, keep it kind of off the map you know yeah for sure and, and i again i totally understand that yeah any good uh stories with regards to that local locals um harassing you or um confrontations oh my god fist fights choke i look like i think i was such a scrawny kid that people weren't like completely bashing me but yeah i mean i'd get like definitely sent in all the time and uh-huh yeah, no, there was, I mean, And no so kidding, many. like you'd be out and someone would say like, oh, there's a camera on you right now, you're out of here? Yeah, wow. for sure. Wow. Well, I think it was, I mean, that was a while ago now and it's changed so much, you know? Yeah, no, it's changed so much. And you, so much. We started to talk about this earlier, but the, um, I grew up in the age of localism. In fact, the beaches where your father is from, mm -hmm. growing up in LA County, I would drive north to these spots. Mm-hmm. Some of them are popular now. Some of them, there's many, we could go on Instagram and then we can see those wedge, wedge waves totally. all over. But there was a time when they were so forbidden if you mm -hmm. didn't live there. And you had to hit them in such a low key manner. And, you know, you'd go by yourself. You'd like, there was a chance your tires could be flattened when you got out. Yeah. Um, but now it's, it, there's been this sort of very quick sort of turn where like localism is not allowed. You can't treat people like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such a, it's such an odd thing because for me, and I try to not, there's like, it's refreshing in many ways. I, I, I was surfing up here on the central coast yesterday and I was so um, surprised by just how cool everyone was with each other. Yeah. And there was like the vibe on the beach in the parking lot where everyone's kind of got, you know, got their wetsuits hanging on the back of their trucks or vans and they're chatting it was so friendly. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, coming to the Central Coast was like, I'm from LA. I've got to be, I got to hide from these people. Yeah. So that part of it's nice. But then there's another side where you do get in the water and there is, it, it, it's gotten crowded, you know, undeniably. Yeah. Oh, no, totally. And that, that happened, you know, there still are spots up here where you don't get like a lot of people showing up and being loud and whatnot. And there's still is some regulated spots as I think there should be also. But yeah, I mean, I, I personally struggle with it so much because it is, it's just, it's so different now. And I feel like growing up, I had to be so respectful and I was constantly getting sounded like, mm -hmm. like taught the way directly and indirectly, like how to act and pecking order and all that stuff. And I want to keep that mentality, but then I'm also like, I feel like such a hypocrite yeah. by ever saying anything to anyone because it's, I've you know, I, I mean, sorry, in the sense of like photos or video and stuff like that. Like everybody yeah. has their phone now and it's like, oh, I just, I can't do that because, you know, yeah. sorry, I'm not making sense there. No, but. it makes total sense. And I, I see it, but you know, the thing I've thought about it so much because I, similar to you, I think, um, I've written about surfing for so many years. I was a pro surfer once. So, so the growth of surfing has benefited me in many ways. It's created mm -hmm. opportunities for me that I never imagined would have happened um, if it was a smaller industry or, or culture mm -hmm. population, I would not be, I, there, 
it, 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 I benefit in so many ways as surfing expands. Yeah. However, when I go surfing on a Saturday morning and it's too crowded and I come out grumbling and bummed out, that's like, ah, oh, that that's I don't want that. So it's a weird. Yeah. We're we're all like hypocritical, and of there's course, there's a yeah double edge to it. I know it's so it's so confusing and so hard to wrap your head around. Like I feel like I was just talking to a friend about this the other day. It's almost as if surfing is way more popular than it's ever been right I, now. I agree, but there's like a shell of an industry in mm -hmm. a weird sense I know. where like. Say five, 10 years ago, I surfing the industry of it was so thriving and just like this machine that was moving where then you'd go to the beach and it still was like surfing was super cool, but like maybe underground yeah. like yeah. thing. I, I don't know. It's hard to articulate that, but it's, it's essentially... It's just weird now how there's like, feels like there's kind of the shell of an industry, yeah. but surfing is top of everyone's list. Yes. Like there's more surfers now than there ever has been. Yeah. And there's, n doesn't seem like the industry support in the, in a sense. No, you're so right. And the, but the other side of it that I think is interesting is it, I think it is like a, a COVID and now post COVID thing. Mm -hmm. And it is sort of the wave storm brigade. It's like people yeah. who are, they don't, what, what's nice about it is I think there's always been like back in the 50s, 60s, there was the term hodad, which is like someone that's trying to look like a surfer, but they don't actually surf. Now you have people who don't even want to look like surfers, but they do want to surf. Yeah, totally. And they've got the wave storm stacked on the roof of their car. Yeah. Uh, fins in the back. <laughs> they don't, so, you, know, you see a lot of that. Um, but yeah, but I, you know, the other side of it is I've, I've thought, I've pondered kind of like localism, territorialism, the selfishness that comes with surfing. And in many ways, I mm -hmm. think if you get to the root of it, it's just how much we love a good way of coming to us and ha and knowing it's ours. Yeah. It's no. just like, it's a, it's a, it's like a level of passion in so many ways. Well, if you think about it too, surfing is so unique, like all the cliches about it or whatnot, but you really, like when you really break it down, we're in the ocean, which is public domain we don't have to pay anything to be there, you know? Like, how many things are there that are really like surfing left, you know? It is so unique in that sense where yeah. we all feel entitled to each wave or whatever, your spots and whatnot, but you strip it all back and you, you take away all that bullshit. It's like, it's the most primitive thing left, you know what I mean? Like, you're- For sure. Even to go, I don't know. I mean, I don't really snowboard, but it seems like there's a lot of infrastructure there to like- pay and money and all kinds of time and whatnot no for sure and what you just said i think is even more it's 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 it, you feel it here more so than other places for instance because for instance i live in la county and i'm on the north end or the west end of la county if i go to the S south bay let's say mm -hmm. and i go surfing at el porto i look up and there's houses on tops of houses and it's such a you feel this like concrete jungle basically like yeah. encroaching on the ocean whereas here you look and you just see this a lot of just this rugged beaut raw natural beauty and the yeah. hills and it's you get a lot of that i mean just you and i did a little surf check before this and like this is like i'll remember those spots for a long time mm -hmm. as being just stunning and the waves weren't great but just the way the rocks were on the beach and the headland and the yeah. rocky ruggedness um what does it feel like to be from the central coast and sort of representing the central coast i mean it's not it's it's a little less of like a trodden path here i think yeah, I mean, I think there was no real set path. You know, there's definitely been incredible surfers before me that are, you know, more talented, but maybe the chips didn't all fall in the right place to, like, really break out of it, you know? But, you know, I also struggle with, and I, I don't want to be, like, cynical on myself, but I struggle with the fact, like, I don't exactly know what, I really ever accomplished in surfing, mm -hmm. if, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, and that might be the free surfing side of it that I, or the free surfing path that I went down. Yeah. It's less tangible. Yeah. Or, or that could be just like who I am as a person. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't really stop and give myself, I don't do any reflection or praise really ever. Um, so I don't know. I, I have a hard time hearing that because I feel like there was so many more talented people than me mm -hmm. but i like you alluded to i i did end up 
making it and being sort of a face of a of the Central Coast surf community. And um, I mean, I'm super honored, but yeah, I don't I don't sit there and celebrate it because I don't know when, you know, yeah. like I, I really didn't end up being like a world champion or anything like that. Like I I I'm so proud of like the magazine coverage and the films I was a part of. And mm -hmm. it was kind of weird timing too, because I feel like I got to be in two really big films kind of right as the I don't want to say the industry like the industry kind of backed out mm -hmm. so to say mm -hmm. like yeah i was part of the the last Volcom film which was psychic migrations and part of this globe film which was strange rumblings and changer law and both of those were like big budget high production films and essentially after those two films came out there wasn't a ton of like marketing dollars getting thrown at films mm -hmm. so it's just kind of a long way of saying like I was part of those two films and it really carried because those films were had a lot more of an impact because they were kind of like the end of an era. Yeah. And people are still watching those films where like I think in a normal scenario, I almost would have just, I don't know, fizzled out because there was other films coming out, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't know. I I struggle with that question, sure, to be sure. totally honest. No, because I I don't I don't look in reflection and be like, oh, I no, I think fucking killed it. For sure. Know? I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> like, I, don't, we, I still we, don't think I We did. like that about you. Oh, yeah. What about the legend of uh, Dave Parmenter looming over overhead for, for coming up in this area? Yeah. I mean, he was definitely a generation before me. So I, and I feel like by the time I came to age where he would have been surfing with me or noticed me or whatnot, he was a lot more invested in spending time in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And, um, but ironically, one of my best friends growing up, uh, Zach Hartley, who's an incredible surfer, he lived with Dave. Um, I, he was almost, it was a, it was a trippy living situation, but it was like this little house in, in San Luis in the big town. And, um, and Dave just kind of kept his stuff there, but he was never really there. Mm -hmm. But he'd come home every once in a while. And I was essentially living with Zach because there was always an open room there. And um, so, yeah, the, the few times I did surf with Dave were, were later later on. When I was a kid, it, there was such an, an allure of him, like you're saying. Yeah. But I didn't get to experience too much of it. Right. I was a little younger, but sort of contemporary with him. We traveled on tour together. I got to know him. And what's interesting is... For me, in, in so much of, I'm sure, like, when I ask a question, like, how does it feel to represent the Central Coast, I'm sort of projecting onto you mm -hmm. what I have from growing up with Dave and him being such a big figure. Yeah. And he was from this area. Through him, I know of the, a kind of almost a romantic idea of this place where it's like isolated, windy, you know, the, the ocean's like sort of unfriendly and you're out there alone and it's cold and maybe sharky and all the rest of it. And that's mm -hmm. how I think of it. But the thing that was interesting about Dave from my generation is by being on the Central Coast and by being one of the, one of the great brains of surfing in my mind, mm -hmm. um, he kind of like denounced a lot of commercial surfing. Like he, yeah. he, was, he was such a great surfer and he was such an important figure to my mind in surfing. And yet it was sort of like, and the commercialization is a joke. And he protested that in yeah. various ways. So I think of, I almost think of this as this place where like you would, you would almost like turn your back on the commercial side of surfing to, to be a surfer up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's so true. There was always stories about how he was always surfing by himself. Mm -hmm. And I, I really resonated with those because I, I do that so much up here, Yeah, you know, not, not so much now, but say like when I was filming a lot, I would by design go to wherever people weren't. Yeah. And I'd wait for essentially bad wind, you know, like, like, so it'd be air wind and I'd be tucked in a little cove. And I was savvy to the idea that like, Hey, I can't do the world's best air, but if I can do a good air with a cool backdrop, mm -hmm. then it makes it a lot further than a cool air without a backdrop, if that yeah. makes sense. So I would just always creedle around in little nooks and crannies up here and essentially surfing far inferior waves to what was available. But by doing that, I was I was creating more opportunities and kind of trying to do what Dave was doing because he was always doing that mm -hmm. prior to me. Yeah, interesting. Um, it seems that way. I mean, it just feels like a more solitary interior kind of surfing experience here than it does in SoCal. Yeah, I 
I would always, it was funny, like younger days or whatnot and going down South, I would get so easily frazzled on crowds Mm -hmm. because I just don't have that side of my brain. So to say, like I just easily get so rattled in crowds, Yeah, but I would always love going down there for the sense of like, uh, you could like take off on a wave bottom turn and look up at the lip and you could like get to the lip and do a turn. And then like the wave actually broke where Mm -hmm. up here you do that, you bottom turn. And by the time you look at the lip, it's too late. It like hit a bounce and like slams you in the face or something. Like just the experience of surfing down there. Mm -hmm. Although the crowds were scary to me, it was like the wave quality, just being real waves. And like you could Uh draw out and actually surf where up here, I just never feel like I could do that. Yeah. No, I think it's a little bit more kind of like welcoming and user friendly in SoCal, a lot of those waves. Yeah, and like you said earlier, like, um, kind of how I how I surf doesn't seem like it's up here, like it meshes well with up here. But it, I think it's actually just, um, uh, like why I surf like that is yeah. because I struggle to find waves where I can do two consecutive turns yeah. most of the year. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so pumping down the line and doing an air is like. Right. Very natural to me. You're utilizing the resources available. <laughs> totally. Yeah. What about um, shark stories? You ever see a shark? Yeah, I've had plenty of shark run-ins. There's a there's a wave up the coast that's notoriously just alive with marine life out there. And I've gotten chased in a couple of times up there. Um, yeah. And I actually, the, the f- scariest one was, um, it was actually like along just, I was on my honeymoon with my wife, obviously, and we were we had rented an RV and it was just her and I. And we were like driving down the coast of Oregon and it was a beautiful, like glassy, rare day up there. And we pulled off up there and I was just surfing this little sandbar just by myself. And it was probably, I don't know, it looked so appealing because it was only like 20 feet off the beach. It was like a high tide, like little left. And I, I hadn't surfed at all. So I jumped out there and and there was this little sandbar out the back where waves would almost cap. And I remember just sitting out there and like looking in, my wife was just like walking around on the beach and I looked back out and there was, I've never seen a shark like that, but it was like, it must've been like an old, old dog, like great white. And it was, you know, like I've been chased out of the water plenty here and it's like, oh, that's a shark fin. You know, this thing was like, it was this giant triangle and it wow. probably went like no joke, six or eight feet out of the water. Wow. But, like I've seen so many sharks here. Right. But the, the fins always like your traditional shark fin. This was a giant triangle. I've never wow. seen anything like that. And was it kind of like scarred up and stuff? <clears throat> oh yeah. Around? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it almost ironically looked like the shark was coming in and it got like stuck on that sandbar. Cause it started going, it, it was like, jeez, I don't know. It was the, that was the craziest one. Luckily, none of that here, but chased in plenty of times by big, big animals. When you big, say ch- when you big s- marine animals out there. When you say chased, is it you see it and you go in, or is it like it's moving towards your direction, sort of thing? Yeah, a couple times have definitely moved towards my direction. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's it is alive up here mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. There's there's plenty of activity out in the water. So you survived the shark in Oregon, you were on your honeymoon, and then how long after did you have your first kid? Let's see. We had our first, I want to say five years after we got married. Okay. Yeah. And now you have three. And now I have three. And yes. how old are they? Um, six, nine, and 12. Nice. Yeah. Has being a father changed your relationship with surfing? Um, I would say so, yeah. I, I used to be just, you, you know like surfing, especially when it was like a real career for me, which is crazy to say, like I was so fortunate that it got to be a career. Um, I just felt like I had to stay so mentally, like all the full capacity of my brain had to like stay engaged in it and be ready to leave at the drop of a hat and get on a plane or whatever, you know, I was so immersed in it that um, being a, father now like for sure has changed that Mm -hmm. you know and i don't want to knock surfers in general but it's just helped me realize like 25 years of my life were like so self-centered with surfing like it's 
it's pretty crazy how selfish you are when you're stuck in like a wild surfing ride. And I'm, again, I'm not trying like to each their own. No. But for me personally, yeah. I just realized like, oh my God, like I'm out there doing everything all about me all day. Yeah. And it's, so I've really appreciated getting a different perspective. Yeah. You know, I, I almost just hated always, I was so excited to have kids, but for like my own reasons, like I felt like I'd always cringe when people would be like, oh, it'll change your life. Like, you know, just all the cliches that people say. And I just hadn't really thought about it for a really long, you know, like it just didn't hit me. Mm -hmm. Like when my kids were younger, I was still surfing and traveling a lot and, and just doing my thing. But it's weird. It's like, as my oldest has gotten to this age of like 12, you're like, you realize you're looking at like a little you mm -hmm. and it, more so than mm -hmm. like, say when they're six or something, like it's almost like this really relatable time for me. Yeah. And it just has me realizing like, I'm just so grateful that I do have other things that pull me away from surfing sometimes yeah. too, because it's, it's super healthy. Like surfing is the healthiest thing. Right. But mentally i feel like for me personally i needed to get sucked away from it sometimes too i can't have it be the only thing and and it's just amazing that you get to see what else is out there you know what i mean for sure no i had a similar experience i mean i feel like i was spawned from the bubble of surfing and i was that was all i knew and i was mm -hmm. so in it and i believed in it so deeply and then i had my kind of later in my 30s i just realized there was a lot i was missing yeah. i i and, and, and it's funny with surfing because i think and I'm sure you had a similar experience, but it's like one of the coolest thing about things about surfing is that kind of baked into being a serious surfer is travel. So you get to go to all these places. You go to the North Shore, yeah. you go to Australia, you go to South Africa, et cetera, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And you you engage with people from other places and you learn and you grow in that way. But I had a period where I sort of was taking stock of my life and I was like, okay, I've traveled a lot. And to my surf buddies, I'm the world traveler guy. But in fact, all I've really done is hung out in the sort of homogenized community of surfing around the world. Everywhere I've gone have always been surfers. Mm -hmm. And while they while they speak various language and in various countries, they're also like, we're all praying to the God of surfing. Yeah, And it's cool to sort of get out of that. Like, I do think that's like a nice thing to expand from that. Yeah, no, totally. I, I mean, I feel so fortunate that I got to travel as much as I did. And it's like, that is the most incredible thing that I never thought I'd get to do, you know, like, of course, like getting waves and whatnot is all so, so like top of the list. But when you look back and in, in the reflection period, it's like all that travel was so incredible. Yeah. The travel is so amazing. When you think back on your surfing life so far, there's mm -hmm. plenty more I'm sure in front of you, but thinking about it now in the context of now you have three children, your, 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 your base is here. Looking back, what what stands out? What's what did you learn? What did you? How did it help you to grow as a person? Um, well, I don't know. That that part's hard, and I actually have been struggling with this a little bit. I think because I got to travel so much. I mean, I'd be gone like eight months out of the year. And, yeah, and you know, you did it. It's like it's hard now to be like oh, let's jump on a plane. Sure. Like, I, I don't know. It's just like this weird period where I look back and I'm like, oh my God, like that was so incredible to do. But almost this weird feeling of like, I just want to be home now, you yeah. know? So, yeah. so it, it, it taught me so much, but I also need to learn how to like kind of embrace it again, mm -hmm. but on a new, in a new light, like where I'm going around with my family and whatnot too, you know? Yes. So I look forward to that and hopefully getting to experience that with them. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's a totally different thing. And Yeah. When I was a pro surfer and on tour, there was an Aussie guy named Saul Baker who's no longer with us, but he, was, he became a really lovely friend and he was a deep thinking guy. And I remember one time he said to me, you know, Jamie, there are, there are people who travel around the world and then there are people who sit in their own backyard. And some of those people who sit in their own backyard visit more places than the people who travel around the world. <laughs> and it was kind of a, a cosmic uh, observation. But, yeah. but at the same time, like you raising three children, I'm sure it is taking you to newer places than you would be if you were on the Volcom house on the North Shore, which you've sort of done, you know? Yeah, no, totally. I'm... 
I don't know. It's just weird too. For so long, I was like a trained like circus animal, essentially. Like somebody would set up a tripod on the beach, and I'd go out and I'd try to jump off of a wave, you know. And it's just like I'd fall one thousand times and be so mad at myself and so down on myself, and then land one silly little air, and I'm back on top of the world. I'm so happy, and you know, it's, it's so it's like I was so trained to do that for so long that when you come home and you just like jump out in the ocean on like a little shitty one foot day and it's offshore and you do a couple of turns on a twin fin and you're like huh is this surfing like mm -hmm. you know like i feel like i didn't even experience surfing like most surfers experience it yeah. because i was such a trained person to do these weird things i don't know I, no and i so relate to that and i went through my like existential crisis in my post pro surfing years because i i did i hit it so hard and you know, you're, you were a free surfer and, and errors was a big part of what you did. For me, it was totally contest-based. So mm -hmm. it was really like every time I went surfing, I was rehearsing in my mind a competition yeah. and I was imagining that I had a singlet, a jersey on, and I was it, it was a make or break heat that was going to get me into the top 16, which is what I was aspiring to. And that fueled me. And the beautiful thing that I realize now is like, the worst crappy onshore day was so large in my mind because I just, it was like I had this like imagination that was mm. projecting into something so much larger than the thing that I was doing. When I stopped competing, I, my crisis was like, why am I even doing this? And what's the point of all this? There's not, I'm not, I'm retired. I'm not competing anymore. And therefore like, why go out in crappy waves and what does this do, do for me? But for me, many, many, many years later now, like I've realized that the, the pointlessness is almost the point. Like there's a, there's something beautiful, especially in adult life of doing something that's just like purely play has no tangible, there's no, there's no motivation other than just to sort of like dance, flop around in the water and clear your head a little bit, you know? Yeah. No, I totally relate to that. I mean, I just, for so long was, <laughs> did, I was doing that, that exact same thing. You know, I went, yeah. I've, I've gone through all of that and I feel like I'm, in that phase right now where I'm just essentially like identity crisis with surfing, you know? And, yeah. and I have other opportunities. So I try to chase those and then I'm like, I don't know. But it's real. I mean, I think a lot of people deal with this and it's cool to talk about it. Cause I don't know if everyone verbalizes it. And for some people that are kind of clinging more tightly to their careers and their persona in the surfing world, they wouldn't, it would be like, they wouldn't want to admit something like that. But I think, mm. um, well, I love what you said about the dancing train circus animal because that is so true. It's great to see that because so often that thing that you just described and those people who are in the height of doing it in their lives are so revered. And these are the people we champion in surfing and they entertain the hell out of us. Mm -hmm. And while I love them and I don't want them to stop, but at the same time from a different angle, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a joke what's going. It's like it's not as cool as it seems because it's really um yeah. It's so performative. It's so it's so to like keep the sponsor money rolling in and to sustain this great thing. And it is a great thing, but there's there's something sort of absurd about it at the same time. Yeah. No, it's tough when you're looking behind the scenes at what it all is. And yeah, you know, but it's only because I'm fortunate enough that I've gotten to a place where I can see behind the scenes, you know what I yeah, mean? And then for you, sure. And, and it's just like anything, you know, if I was I had a different career of all these years i would have a i would have all angles of it to look at you know like it's yeah. exposed from all angles so i'd say that's the only only reason i think like that now you know sure <laughs> sure um so let's i'm curious about sort of your day-to-day -day now and the first question i want to ask you is tell me about kinetic sculpture yeah so kinetic sculpture is essentially my day-to-day -day now it, it's um I don't really know where to begin with it, but it, so it's just all, it's always been a part of my life. Like my, I think in kind of like trying to tie all this together, I'll, I'll do a bad job at it, but I, I was raised so, so differently and in such a <clears throat> unbeknown to me, such a creative way. Like my parents were both artists. They were, they had no money, right? They were when I was born, they were both woodworkers, like toy makers. Mm -hmm. My mom made these wooden baskets that look kind of looked like a cutting board. And then she would like, 
you do a couple movements with it and it turned into this basket. Um, hard to explain, but really cool. And then my dad made all these toy, um, like climbing bears and little propellers, just little things. And they sold them at craft shows. And so that was my life growing up was just like craft shows. And mm -hmm. when they would make enough money, right, they would take that money they made and they'd put it into building our house. And they, the two of them single-handedly built our house. They had somebody come and do like the plaster on the outside, but everything else was done by them. And it's this really cool timber frame home that was, you know, my mom did all the stained glass. My dad, it's like all mortise and tenon, so there's no nails in it. It was like a, taken after like a New England traditional barn, like 1800s. Like my dad was really inspired by those. So, so long way of saying I was raised in a very creative household and, um, and I just didn't really know anything different. And my, my parents for 12 years, they built our house. Like that was how little of money was trickling in. And, you know, they just took the time and did it themselves. So mm -hmm. they saved every penny. Ironically and sadly, the, 12 years of construction <laughs> might have hindered their marriage but so they as soon as the house was completed when i was 12 they got a divorce mm -hmm. and my mom <clears throat> went on to work at a really nice contemporary gallery down in in san luis where she would um still do a lot of woodworking art stuff that she made and sold in there and and my dad stayed um out on the property and got into metalworking, mm -hmm. started working with metal. We transitioned from the wood to the metal. Um, we had a good friend that his dad taught my dad how to weld. And so my dad started, um, he was really inspired, like, you know, I'm probably going to get my, my years wrong, but like Alexander Calder, he's like, I want to say like late 1800s or early 1900s that made those incredible mobiles. Sure. Um, yeah. And then, and so he was, really inspired by him but then later um was george ricky and george ricky is he was like real kinetic sculptures and like kind of like three-dimensional like incredible like ge geometric shapes mm -hmm. and just incredible movement and my dad was very inspired by him um and he had like a big piece at uh there's still i think it's still there on campus point at ucsb oh wow and, and we'd always go and because you, you cut it's right by the break actually oh that's so cool and we'd always go stand under it and uh -huh. so my dad was very inspired by him so my dad my mom ended up taking a traditional job you know at that gallery to make ends meet but my dad he never did he mm -hmm. never took a traditional job he's always he's built every home he's lived in and he's never gotten like a paycheck from working for someone you know like it's it's pretty crazy looking back now you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. how indirectly i was molded to be kind of on a path of being like on a, a free path so to say yeah um so but yeah my dad he started on the kinetic sculptures and so I, from the time i was like 15 i was essentially like grinding for him you know wow. what i mean so i've been with him he's had a 35 year career and i've been around it the whole time you mm -hmm. know and, and he's he grew to be um like a really renowned kinetic sculptor he's, he's super humble and like he's just like a hermit that lives out in the woods and he's mm -hmm. not like good at marketing himself but as far as like a gallery standpoint and he's in the best galleries and he's like one of like four kinetic sculptors essentially in the i mean there are other kinetic sculptors but he's like top four like ones that make big pieces for commercial and residential and sell at these galleries so wow um kinetic sculpture meaning that the sculptures move yeah i'm sorry yeah. so no no that's okay uh, no i wanted to hear that but just for our listeners who may not know because i i did my research and i looked it up so i understood it okay. but i understood it to be sculptures that can basically move yeah so a kinetic sculpture you know like a kinetic sculpture is essentially a kinetic sculpture is essentially a sculpture that moves where a static sculpture will be your more like contemporary piece of art that's just sitting there yeah but kinetic means there are moving elements to yes it. yep no you know i think it can mean a million different things yeah like a mobile could be a kinetic sculpture but though the formula that my dad so my dad was a math professor and built some airplanes also 
so he was always very into like the center of gravity mm -hmm. is what's really important in the sculptures. Hmm. And um, so they're, they're perfectly balanced and he's, he has formulas of the angles. So they make all these different random movements. They, they sort of dance in different positions, so to say um, one sculpture when it's just sitting there can take on a certain formation mm -hmm. and then like a little gust of wind and it'll completely flip and flop to like a totally different formation. Okay. So yeah, the, that's, that's the beauty of the pieces that, that he's sort of created and he's created a movement that nobody else has been able to, um, mimic, so to say. Wow. There has to have been a moment in your dad's life where he's seen either a clip of you or a still photo of you boosting some giant air and gone, my son is a chip off the old block. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he he was like my first photographer. Like, oh wow, yeah, he loved it. Uh huh. Um, yeah, he would always take photos, so he was. That's cool. Yeah, there's a kinetic sculpture in a still photo of a big boosting air. Yeah, there's Especially, still one on his fridge from when I was like 16. <laughs> that's great because I love you were saying earlier, like, and I know this. I don't know it because I don't know how to do an aerial. But if you do do aerials, I know wind factors in in a big way with keeping mm -hmm. your board under your feet. Yeah, and that's so interesting because the kinetic sculptures rely upon like a breath of wind to to yeah. to move them around. So you you now you make sculptures, yes? Yes. So I've. I worked beside him, like I said, since I was like 16 and needed gas money, I would grind the sculptures for him. So I was always, um, I was always in and around the sculptures and a part of it in a, in the sense of just like more of like a laborer, so to say. Mm -hmm. Um, and with him being so established and doing his thing as a kid, I always wanted to like sort of do my own, but I was always making sculptures under him mm -hmm. so to say mm -hmm. like he had these other galleries he'd moved on to these more like exoskeleton like more advanced sculptures but he had these like his early years but and they were a lot lower price point but galleries wanted them and so when i was trying to make money for to travel to hawaii or whatever when i was younger i would make those sculptures kind of his like first iteration of them yep and i would sell them to the galleries under his name okay and so i was always building sculptures mm -hmm. and then um yeah as of the last 10 years sort of when i i mean i've always been i've always felt like surfing was just going to disappear for me mm -hmm. so i've always been like a doomsday like prepping for the worst of surfing so to say yep um i always thought i was never going to get a contract re-signed every december i'd go through like a meltdown and mm -hmm. so i what I'm getting at is I would always be kind of working with him and, mm -hmm. and just seeing where I fit in with it and trying to make my own sculptures and whatnot. But yeah, I, I've, as of the last like five to 10 years, I've been working directly under him because he's been slowly phasing out. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, like three years ago, he completely retired okay. and, and he has me, I took over on the galleries and I'm now just creating the art under the family name I see. of Tyler. You wow. know, they're, they're, I, you know, like ego aside, I, I didn't want to like go in and be like, these are Nate Tyler sculptures uh -huh. now, you sure. know, like I, I wanted to honor mm -hmm. him and, mm -hmm. and do that. So yeah, they're, they're just same galleries mm -hmm. and, and I'm getting to create them, you know, with using all his engineering. So. Wow. That's so great. Yeah. It's really incredible. What you said about, the, the kind of doomsday and feeling like your surfing career was tenuous and it could end tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I always felt that way as well. And then when I became a writer and got deeply into that, I realized that sort of pro surfing prepared me for the artist's life and the uncertainty that surrounds that. And mm -hmm. that's there every day and is today and will be tomorrow, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. But it's kind of, um, I don't know, there's something, I think that's true of anything, but then there are, there are vocations that, maybe are in denial of that more than others, but when you're, when you're making, when you're an artist and, and, and kind of in that, you stare at that in the face yeah. more directly than others, I think. Oh, of course. I, I always make the joke. I'm like, man, I thought I was neurotic when I was a pro surfer. I'm way more neurotic now that I'm an artist. <laughs> like yeah. you don't sell a piece for a while. And you're like, ah, yeah. But yeah. yeah, I, I was, I just always felt like, obviously very fortunate but i kind of had this weird feeling like i shouldn't be there in surfing you know or mm -hmm. like i was super um 
like I could just disappear, yeah. you know? And yeah. so I was always kind of prepping for that. Mm -hmm. And it just like created the mindset of like, which I think is perfect for what I do now because I'm, I'm just, I don't know. It, it keeps me, I'm really motivated. Like I create a lot of art, yeah, but I do, I do know what to do when they're not selling, you know, I, sure. I go and I work with my hands and create other things and try yeah. to make ends meet, you know? No, I love it. It sounds like you were raised in a very sort of, with a sort of self-reliance that was part mm -hmm. of the family. And, and, and there's a lot of self-reliance to making yourself a pro surfer in yeah. whatever route you take, whether it's competitive or free surfing, but it's, um, it's no matter what, you're kind of just making it up as you go along and just kind of improvising and, and, and like, it's not, there's no formal path there. Yeah. Um, Definitely correlations between the two. <laughs> for sure. For it's sure. Crazy. But the other thing too is the feeling of the one thing that I think probably it serves you well now um, and will continue to is I'm, you, when you're a pro surfer, there, again, we, we were talking about this earlier, like there's a level of self importance that it's actually serves you as a, as a hungry competitive surfer, whether you're competing literally or you're a free surfer, but you're just trying to keep your sponsorship bills and checks coming in. Mm -hmm. But you have to like have ego, like ego will drive you forward. Um, and it's, it's also very healthy to feel like every day is the last day of your life to some extent, because you're just going to maximize and do these things that you need to do. But with, as you get older and you move on from it, and I have many years on decades on, I look back and I'm like, pro surfing years just fraction of a lifespan if you if provided mm -hmm. you are lucky enough to have a full life yeah it's a tiny little piece um but there are so many great i think lessons and it's almost like a metaphor for so many other things in life you know yeah i know i i feel like the one thing like i know i lacked it in surfing and i i lack it on a daily thing but like i lacked confidence with surfing mm -hmm. like i feel like i had such I was gifted such great opportunities in surfing and my confidence levels just weren't there sometimes. And I look back and just wish that I was more uh, like a more of a firm believer in like who I was and talent mm -hmm. and whatnot, because I just, I sort of was my own worst enemy was yeah. surfing, you know? And, yeah. and it's cool to be aware of that now. Yeah. That's, it's really empowering feeling to be aware yeah. of that because now I try to, it's just funny, like working with my hands, like I can be confident because it's not, I don't have to be like this face out there, like acting like I'm the one that everybody's looking at, you know, like I can just go in my shop and I can build things sure, and, and I can be really confident with like the, the output, like the, the product in the end, you know? For sure. And the other thing, I mean, the, the other thing that I think when you're a pro athlete, you don't realize, um, you, there's an hourglass and it's like turned on its side and you're just watching the sand drip out and you've got a short amount of time. And, and by mm. the time you're like in your mid thirties, you better have, I mean, even earlier, your late twenties, if you haven't really hit it, it's not going to happen for you. Yeah. When I sort of graduated out of pro surfing and I thought I want to be a writer and I had very delusional ideas about what that meant. But the one thing that I did really love and felt so comforting was that like all my heroes were in their 60s. Like my favorite writers were older guys, yeah. whereas, whereas my favorite surfers were already aging out and they were 35 at that time. You totally. Know? So you, the, the gist of it is, is like you, there's a longer, there's a, it's not, you're not racing the clock so much. Yeah. Well, I was pretty um, unique in surfing too. Like in my world, you, you wanted to remain ageless, right? So I was never advertising like my age or anything, but I was pretty late to like everything. Like I started at 13, like I was saying. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I think I was like writing whitewater at 11 or no, sorry, at 12 or something. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think I even made it out the back till I was like 13, which is pretty late for this day and age. There's like 13 year olds that are better surfers than me. You know what I mean? Like it's wild how quick they start. And then, you know, I was like, I was saying, I had signed up for community college when I got my first call to go on a real trip you know, so I was what, 18 then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I didn't get like a real break in a video part. till I was like 26 or yeah, something. Yeah. And then I had the opportunity with the globe movies when I was like 30, you yeah, know? So, yeah. so I was pretty, pretty late to all of it. Yeah. But looking back, it's like, I feel like that was, it was obviously for a reason, you know, like sure. I, I just, maybe it, 
I had to be a little more, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it was strange. Yeah. And yeah, with like you were to connect it back to what you were saying with art, it is cool because I look at my dad and he just did it. He's, he turned 79 this year. And um, I mean, he did it till he was like 75 and was yeah. creating the best, you know, like he only got better. And yeah. Well, so it's, it's, no, but it's so interesting. And I, I think I've thought about this a lot and you, you're making visual art. I make, I write, but there's a thing where you, you're not relying upon your physical prowess to, yeah. to advance yourself. You know, that's not, it's, it's, it, your life experiences can become a part of the work that you make and they can benefit it where you could argue that's true with surfing and some of the great surfers are, you know, people who are fighting against something in their life that they mm -hmm. didn't get and that drives them forward. But they're also like their physicality is going to run out and they're still going to have the second half of their life most likely, you know? Yeah. Um, what are your goals and what do you dream about now? I don't know. Um, you know, what's funny is I was kind of worried you were going to ask a question like that because I feel like it's so sad to not have an immediate answer to that question. Yeah. That it almost gives me like a little bit of angst to not have the right answer. But I think a realistic answer for me is, as I'm just excited to be like slowing down, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost going to sound cliche or it's hard to, hard for me to explain, but I'm excited about not being super ambitious. Great. I've led a life where my ambition is like top tier for me. And I'm just like, like a fucking border collie chasing a ball every day. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, I just feel like I've been like that. And it's weird with my oldest child getting to be of the age that she's at is like, it's making me realize like, whoa, she's going to be driving in like four years. Like what am, what am I chasing after? Like the, you know, I just don't want to be, it's like as surfing fizzles out, I'm not ambitious to go just like try and make a ton of money and live a better life, like monetary wise, you know, I'm, I'm more excited about just kind of taking a page out of my parents' book, like what they did. And they just slowed way down. They mm -hmm. didn't need anything. And they were there for, for my childhood, you know? And, and I'm, I think I'm excited about that. So that was a long form answer. No, but it's an absolutely perfect one. And the fact that we were sitting in cruise control Cambria is almost <laughs> comical. <laughs> totally. That is, I did not put that together. It's um, probably, it was like subliminally. Talking yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, Thank you, Nate. It's been super fun talking to you. Oh, thank you, Jamie. I'm like so incredibly honored. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissett, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Our theme song is Give Me Away by Asuka Matsumiya and Paz Lenchanton. Soundings is brought to you by The Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Bands, and Yeti. The journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening to Soundings. We appreciate you, and until next time.